Welcome to the Hay Kings podcast, sponsored by Vermeer, your trusted source in hay and forage equipment. Today on the podcast, I'm joined by Philip Wardinger. Philip grew up on a farm in the Willamette Valley in Oregon. If you've played Oregon Trail, that's the final destination for everybody going west. Philip has grown up in and around the grass seed industry and the grass straw industry, so he's going to share some of his thoughts around the production area and around the equipment, some very unique equipment. Welcome, Philip. Howdy, John. Thanks for having me. Would you tell me about your family operation growing up? My dad and uncle farmed together for, I guess as they described it, as an overgrown FFA project. You know, they started farming their da- grandpa's pasture when they were in high school. Grew into about, at, our big, at their biggest, 1,500 acres. And we grew everything from sweet corn and green beans to blackberries and strawberries and all sorts of various vegetable seeds, grass seeds, and garlic, you know, a little bit of hay. Uncle always, my uncle always raised a little bit of beef cows, but we always had to have a few, few bales of hay for them. I want to get to the grass seed industry that you work in. That's kind of interesting okay. for our audience here. Can you take me through some of the specialty seed crops that you guys have worked in? I, I should introduce that you're from the Willamette Valley, not just south of Portland. There's kind of a maybe 100-mile 100, 100 long valley there. Yeah, I guess you would describe the Willamette Valley as basically the southern end of Portland metro area all the way to Eugene, kind of what we really refer to as the Willamette Valley. So it's and it's pretty wide. It's not Central California Valley, obviously, but we you know, historically in a lot of cannery crops, processed crops. And as you mentioned, grass seed is king here in Western Oregon. It's considered a specialty crop, but we call it a commodity year. <laughs> so what kind of grass seeds do you grow? Well, we grow it all. I guess it depends on what part of the valley you're in and preference or amount of work you want to do, you know. I do a lot of custom. Nowadays, I, I manage some custom fertilizer spreaders, so I see a little bit of everything. Annual ryegrass or common ryegrass, referred to sometimes as Italian ryegrass. Mm-hmm. And your different types of tall fescues, your turf types, your forage types, perennial ryegrass, uh, forage types for forage type perennials, turf type perennials, so like you use in your yard or your golf courses. Some some Tennessee seed grown, but I think most of that's grown up there near you in Idaho, I think, right? Yeah, northern Idaho and up into Canada. Yeah, but I've seen some around here. Cause I think it's just because of the nature of the beast that we'll get a seed stock field or two once in a while. It just doesn't produce long-term here. Gotcha. A lot of orchard grass grown, too. I fertilize a lot of orchard grass seed fields. Maybe you can take us through some of the differences in production between orchard grass, fescue, ryegrass. Maybe starting with orchard grass. Well, I don't have a huge experience with producing uh, orchard grass. It's something that my dad never grew. Mm-hmm. Um, but honestly, when most grass seed root crops that are grown here in Plant Valley are are handled the same. Um, the only real difference is, is uh, fertilizing timing, your chemical program, and and, your, and when they're harvested. You know, some start harvested in late June, early July, and then you got some some crops that don't get combined until middle of August, just like bent grass is combined in August. It's not late July and combined in August, just because it's such a late maturing crop compared to your annual ryegrass or your tall fifth. Sure, sure. I think, I believe your orchard grass is kind of in the middle of the road, more towards early July for combining. When we combine it, we have to windrow it like you're going to swath it for hay without conditioners in it and let it sit for about 10 days to dry out enough that you can go and thrash the seed off of it. Let's dive into the equipment here. Tell me about the modifications to the swathers, because I know you guys change them up a little bit for the grass seed industry, and then maybe into the combine side of things, and then we can progress on to seed cleaning too. Tell me about these swathers. Well, it depends on what swathers you're referring to, because uh, the one I grew up driving was a Heston 6665 with a 6665 Heston grass seed special. <laughs> what's uh, what's different about that grass seed special header? So it came from Heston with what we all refer to as stub nose guards, and then it does not have did not have the conditioning rule attachments on that. That's what the equivalent hay head would. Uh, the belts that feed to the center, correct? And then just dump it out on the ground well, without conditioning it. Yeah, but the, the early swathers we all had auger headers. We, uh, the vapor headers didn't really take off till about fifty, about twenty years ago. Oh, okay. That's really when they, they took over the market. They were really finally able to prove, produce or show the 
yield you gain from using a, a draper style header over an auger style header. And for those guys that aren't grain growers, a draper header instead of an auger pushing the crop to the center like a combine header, got two two opposing belts that push the crop to the center. Right. A gentler handling yeah. is the thought process yeah. there over the auger that might exactly. act as a little bit of a threshing machine, if you will. Yeah, and then the theory is is you could, because most guys, as I, in the northern half of the Salama Valley, sloth at night when there's a heavy dew on to limit, uh, limit speed chatter. So a lot of the fun, too, is you could start earlier in the day and go longer into the morning with that gentler header. Oh, okay. And, yeah, and then, too, I touched the bases. There's a lot of vegetable seed crops growing here in the Valley. Cabbages, radish, Swiss chard, sugar beets, just any any and all almost will we'll grow. We'll try and grow them at least once here. Mm-hmm. And so then they, they, they feel like those draper headers are even more gentle on the seed crop as well, the high-value seed crop. On those broadleaf seed crops that are more prone to shatter even yeah. even than grass. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta you gotta take them to a drier or drier matter stick before you can cut them in order to get good seed germination and stuff. Oh, that's interesting. Um, it's the same thing with grass seed, right? You gotta cut it slightly green, and then you gotta let it dry in the windrow so you can combine it, right? Otherwise, if you try and direct cut it, and these guys in Missouri will that direct cut tall fescue will probably argue otherwise. But you let it dry in the windrow, and you have a better you can thrash more seed out of it. And then if you would cutting it directly, you run the risk of it falling on the ground before it gets in the combine. Got it. If you cut it too green in the windrow, then your seed might, you run, then you also might run the risk of your seed not maturing enough. And then your germ rates go down. That makes sense. An immature plant has an immature seed. So yeah. I was down in tangent Oregon and I saw these disc headers Without conditioners, and then there were some other funky changes to them. Can you talk me through those? A little bit. I'm not too familiar with with most rotary swathers. As like I said earlier, we we quit farming when before those were really huge. They were uh-huh. on the market, but not a lot of guys had them. Um, I believe on like the New Holland slash case headers, uh, they take the crusher rolls out, obviously. Yep. And then they they add some certain material in there to kind of help as a, a baffle or cushion so that you don't double cut your grass too much mm-hmm. when you're swathing. That's what that extra curtain is. Yeah. And then you'll notice too on a lot of them up front, they'll put a big piece of UHMW or a piece of big belting as a knockdown bar kind of thing. Yeah. That keeps the grass seed heads from whipping back and, and, and shattering on top of the header. Uh, okay, so it's a, an even more exaggerated knockdown bar to make sure that that grass seed stays away from the discs. Yeah, the turtles. You know, to say the controllers, if because tall fescue, you know, can get pretty rank and tall, and those disc shatters, you know, they're only when they're cutting, they're only what foot and a half off the ground, off of them, uh-huh. off of it is. And so when you're going twelve miles an hour through the field, you. You whip, you get that that grassy whiplash. Oh, you're talking about the head flapping back over top of the on on the top side of the header. On the top of the all header, the out on top. Okay. Yeah, I understand. Okay, that makes. I got it. That makes sense to me. I hadn't put that all together yeah. in my head, obviously. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of these guys that I'm saying or sit or listen to this aren't going to understand. Going to have a hard time visualizing those big. Yeah, so it's just an extra two eight foot sheets of plywood almost, or UH and W. Yeah, the one that I saw was basically the same belting, the same uh, heavy rubber plastic material that you would have on the front curtain of a disc mower normally. But then there was another yeah, layer of it mounted up higher that draped down over the head to do just exactly yeah. what you just described to keep the heads of the plants from whipping over the top and slapping on the top of the header. And then it also helps, like you were saying earlier, too. It helps keep push those seed heads in the right orientation, so when you do cut it, also I mean it's you know kind of a bonus there. Yep. Now, do those but, rows but, get raked, or are they just sit out for a week and dry? You just let them sit and dry. If you go and rake them again, you You're shatter all the your seed off. out. Yep. Yeah. So with the rotary swathers, I believe they're right around all of them are right around fifteen feet uh-huh. swather. Most of your draper, your Macdon drapers or your McDeer drapers are about 15 feet, I believe. And 
anybody that's still running an auger header, because there's still a lot of those running around to their price point, right? Right. No, they're right. They're usually right around 15 feet as well. Oh, okay. So, but there are a few guys that have been bringing in some 20 foot draper headers, smacked on drapers with double t- double sickle, because they've been uh, the claws combines have been taking more and more of the market share locally, mm-hmm. and they just go too dang fast. So they want a bigger windrow. So they can slow the combines down so that they can walk behind them and help set them better. Ah, okay. You just said something a little strange about operating combines here. You just said that when they're running the combines, somebody's walking behind, checking the... Checking your tailings. Yeah, checking the tailings. How fast are these combines yeah. going? So it kind of it all kind of depends on, on the size of the combine, the style of thrashing mechanism, you know, your rotary to your cylinder walkers. I believe some of these state claws combines are going anywhere from six to eight miles an hour, crashing grass team. Uh huh. I know grain guys they, they think that's no big deal, but normally, you know, a the John Deere ninety six ten combine would probably do about two and a half miles an hour mm-hmm. in, in a sixteen foot header row. Right. Maybe a little bit slower depending on how heavy the crop was. Right. You're, we're we're doubling and tripling our capacity with combines, but not our slot, not our slothing mechanisms. Okay, I see what's driving that adoption of a bigger header. Some guys don't mind doing the going faster like that. And then you just got some guys that are just real just grassy. You got a lot of fine tuning, a real small crop feed, and so there's a lot of fine tuning adjustments you need to make to your sieves, your fan feeds, that kind of stuff. And mm-hmm. you can't just stop the combine and get out and look. You got to kind of see what it's doing as you're as it's thrashing. Sure. But come guys, you say it. Get on the get on the gator and go. Follow the line of the gator. Reach out with your shovel. <laughs> That's uh, probably a considerable more attention to the little details than most combine operators that are working in corn and soybeans and wheat. <laughs> yeah, you know, I you know growing up, I did thrash a little bit of wheat. We didn't grow a lot of grain just because our soil it was better suited for growing higher value crops. Right. At least for our, in our region, as far as higher value. Yeah, I mean, you guys are only growing like 120 bushel wheat. No big deal. Yeah, without turning water on. <laughs> yeah, no no irrigation. <laughs> like I said, you know, you're just combining wheat or corn. You just kind of look in the in the grain tank and see, oh, you got some white caps, and you turn your, your cylinder speed up, or you, you, know, you, just stop, you, know, you stop at the corner and you crack your sieves open a little bit, or whatever you might have to do. You don't really want to, you don't. You just kind of go because it'll all go either way. Mm-hmm. No trash in the combine, no big deal. But when you start, you mentioned cleaners, um, you combine grass seed. Then you got to haul that grass seed to your clean to your either the cleaner that you may own yourself, or to to whoever you're paying to clean the seed for you. Right. And you're pay and you got to you got to pay for usually on clean out. Guys will charge you on clean weight. Some guys will charge you on. A clean out weight just kind of depends on the cleaner's preference. So you, if you got real real dirty fields and you got to have a clean, it's harder or a couple a time or two extra. That's more money out of your out of your bottom line. So mm-hmm. the better setting you can do your combining, the less money you spend cleaning it. Doing it right the first oh. time is the theme there. Yeah, but then you get a lot of guys that do their own cleaning and they might not try and get all the small pieces of chaff or straw out because they know it'll it'll blow out of the you know the first two screens of the cleaner or something right really easy but they're doing it themselves so they they got more control over the cleaner but then you got guys that just just aren't good farmers sometimes or just don't that's just not what they want to spend the money on right so they'll put their efforts into another crop or another process or something there's a couple more unique things about these combines do some of them have modified grain tanks yeah, it depends on what industry you're, or what what their growers are going for. Okay, you're probably referring to the to the flower seed grower that we we all talk about and joke about. <laughs> Literally, like garden flower flower seed growers, right? Yes. Like you, yes, your guy that you would go down to your local farm store or garden center and buy packets of flower seeds, or yeah. or buy your annual start with the you know and plant them in your garden. Mm-hmm. You know, we grow a lot of vegetable seeds, but there's also a lot of flower seeds growing here in the Silverton community that I live in, more mm-hmm. so than anywhere. Right. One of the big outfits, Triangle Farms, I forget what the name of the seed company is, 
He's got three John Deere 6622s. So those are a hillside combine yeah. in the factory from John Deere. That he cut the grain tank off and built platforms on either side of the combine to put two metal tote bins that seep in and auger right into those instead of into a grain hopper. So what you're telling me is they're not handling thousands of bushels a day. That's fairly no, small, but, small volume, high dollar value production. Well, I wouldn't even necessarily say small, small volume, small lot, like uh, okay. quarter acre, half quarter acre, half acre. He might have a big lot of ten acres or something, right? Of a specific type of flower or something that year, right? But you're, you could go out to a sixty acre field and he could have. 80 different flowers in that 68 field. Gotcha. It's kind of depends. And then you have a similar thing with vegetable seed crops too, right? The customer demand, ebbs and flows of the market, right? COVID yeah. really hammered the, really hammered the vegetable seed market. Mm-hmm. We, you know, and so you might get, get a 20 acre field one year and, you know, and do double what they wanted and the next year, well, you gave us too much seed, so we're not planting that variety anymore. Here's just six acres of this variety. You get half the yield they wanted because of that variety. Right. Very interesting modifications to the equipment there. Combine modifications, you know, guys that grow radish seed, hybrid red radish or, or an OP white daikon radish that's used a lot of forage. Yeah. They got, they got a seed pod. And you got to crack the pod in order to get the seed out. Okay. A lot of guys that do a lot of acres have modified, generally uh, international combines, modified the cylinders to get the pods to crack open better. But the still tried and true method is to put two, basically, crusher rolls either in, um, mounted on the pickup header or right in front of the feeder house of the combine. You know, as that crop flow goes through those rolls, it cracks the tension is set just enough to crack those pods. So what you're telling me you can, is they took the conditioners out of the swathers and put them in the combines. Yeah, but they cut then they cut the ribs off. They made them smooth, though. So. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> that's a good visual. <laughs> so yeah, that's just for that's just for radish, though. Gotcha. The original rotary grass seed special was an overhaul John Deere Moco. A local staff shop and farmer modified the John Deere header to use it in grass seed. But they didn't just take the rollers off the back. They actually mounted three or four vertical short drums. Yeah, and, that, and they're hydraulically powered, high-speed hydraulic motors. And they create a wind baffle in there to help direct the crop to the center without actually hitting any of the header, header frame. Oh, that's fascinating. Because the issue with those ro- with the roller roller, with those rotary headers is there's nothing pulling that crop to the center of the co- of the header without an auger. Right. So the whole point of the whole point of guys wanting to use the rotary headers and the grass seed to get away from the augers and the reel back that beat up the seed crop. Yep, that makes sense. Anyway, a local farmer and fab shop down in Tangent, Oregon, developed the original headers. And then the local John Deere dealer, which was Fisher Implement at the time, bought the rights or however they do that. Yeah. They basically got it. So that if you wanted it, you had to buy it from them. Well, they have then been bought up by Pathé Machinery. Now, if you want a John Deere R450 slaughter to cut grass seed, you have to buy a slaughter, and then you have to pay to modify the header. You have to be really invested in rotary slaughters at that point. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> that is quite the investment. But just so it gives some guys some perspective, it's, you know, the hay guys, you, you, know, you go 12, 14, 16 miles an hour cutting, cutting hay, and it's the same with those rotary grass seed swathers. But with a traditional auger or draper header swather in the grass seed, you're maximum, you're doing six miles an hour. Right, right. Some of these grass seed guys that are growing 5,000 acres of grass seed, are able to cut a lot of grass seed with half the amount of swathers or, or you know, a quarter of the amount of swathers. Wow. That's, there's two numbers there that you just, <laughs> that you just put out there. Uh, 5,000 acres of seed sounds like a tremendous amount to me for a, for a normal is. operation. I mean, it's not even, 
and that's not even the biggest ones out there. Right. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Let's tie the grass seed industry into <laughs> the grass straw industry and the export industry. There you go. So let's uh, let's put a bow tie on this and bring it all together. That's actually how I got on the hay king. Oh yeah. Oh well, ta- I want to hear yeah, this story. Take me through it. Well, the job that I'm currently at, I'm technically the manager of two fertilizer spreaders. We do custom spreading. When I got hired on, we only owned one. And it was previously operated by one of the owners of the company. And for them to justify hiring a full-time help, they decided that there was enough grass seed straw growing between the owners of the company to justify owning their own big baler and tractor, or I should say baling crew, to bale their own their grass straw and, re- and make a little money on it to keep, keep with me, the full-time help, busy in our, what we would consider our slow season. Summer uh-huh. time. Done through the grass seed harvest that year and get through the fall spreading season. And I'm sitting at home and in the hotel room you know, and stumble upon Hate King's page <laughs> on Facebook. <laughs> well, well no. shoot. I don't make hay, but I make straw bales. Right. Yeah, I'd say. My joy. I'd say what you're doing there is a unique mashup of everything from start to finish in the hay industry. <laughs> <laughs> Whether you're putting the fertilizer on the fields for the seed crops that everybody else plants and makes hay out of, or on the backside, you're baling grass straw, which is uh, a unique yeah. concept, I think, to many. Yeah, I don't actually, I kind of miss it, but we don't do any of your straw baling anymore. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the margin just wasn't fair enough to justify the payments on the equipment. Right. We, made, we, were, we were making money just being custom spreaders, custom applicators, we can make more money concentrating on growing that business and trying to build straw. Let's take a break there and we'll get a word from our sponsor. I'm Danny Wan and, and I switched to the Vermeer 604R because I believe this baler is built to last. I bail about 4,000 bales a year and I think as much money you give for a baler, they need to bail 4,000 bales a year even if it's for 10 years, they, they need to get it done. The day I ran it, we absolutely had no issues at all. It fired up and I bailed like some guy. <laughs> It just bailed all day long. Hear the full story at makinghay.com slash haykings. So once you bale grass straw, what's the market for that? Export. Almost all of it goes export. Just like you guys, your Timothy and your your alfalfas out of California and stuff, it it all goes to to the Pacific, mostly the Pacific Rim. Some, you know, can go elsewhere, but it's just used as a filler, you know, in, in feed rations. Yeah. Just uh, China, or Japan, and Korea are probably some of the bigger ones. I do. I think a lot of some goes to China too. You know, yeah. I don't know the numbers on that. You you might have a better idea. So Japan, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, China, those are all big markets for grass. Uh, yeah, for and grass. Just so everybody straw. knows this is what John does for a living. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tracks the market. <laughs> oh, yep. In the hierarchy of things, it truly is just a filler product. Where maybe, yeah, no, maybe you can kind was, of argue there's some nutritional value to Timothy. There's not a lot of arguing about nutritional and then, value in, in grass straw. And a lot of that has to do with, with the types and varieties, right? Your, right. your tall fescues, your, your forage type tall fescues, um, there's a lot, of, a lot of growth, or green growth, that doesn't get you know, over mature even though it's on the seed. Uh-huh. So there's quite a bit more seed value in your, in your fescue straw than your perennial ryegrass straw or even your annual ryegrass straw because once it gets matured at seed, then it just it spends all its energy in producing seed and it takes it all out of that plant growth. You know, and then to cut it, you know, that plant storm it goes goes to a dormant stage. Mm-hmm. Whereas your fescue, your turf your sorry, your forest type fescues tend to keep having a certain amount of growth because that's what they're bred for. Ah, uh-huh, sure. You know, and then your orchard grass straw, and I think even from your Timothy straw, yeah, it's going to have a little more feed value just because they could have, again, there, those are forage type crops. And so, just from the nature of their breeding programs over the years, they just they're, they got better nutritional value. Mm-hmm. Um, your perennial, your perennial ryegrass straw, at least traditionally here in the valley, Lima Valley, mostly turf type, you know, for your lawn and golf courses. Mm-hmm. 
the stuff coming out of like New Zealand, now that's all tr- mostly for your forage crops because they graze so much mm-hmm. down there. You know, their sheep and their cattle, they're just grazing year round. So their breeding programs are geared more towards that, where ours are geared towards your, your retail market for your sheep. Lawns, lawns and uh, golf well, courses. Um, I do a lot of spreading in Central Oregon, Madras, Culver, Prineville, mm-hmm. Costa Bend, and they grow a lot of bluegrass for seed. Mm-hmm. That's one of their bigger crops just over there. And it's basically a similar market as here. The only difference is that the grass straw doesn't get doesn't get exported. It's got better feed value. It's got better feed value, but it's uh, it doesn't press well. It doesn't make a uh, it doesn't. Sh- can't get a lot of weight on the container mm-hmm. and there's there, the volume's not there right They're, they grow we say they grow a lot there but they're still just not huge volume like there is of these other varieties growing here on the left side so it's hard to create a market for something that's already limited right i get bluegrass that comes in as a kind of a weed in my timothy stands i like to thank the canadian geese for that is it bluegrass or is it an annual bluegrass you know there's a few different types of annual bluegrass. We have bluegrass seed production just south of us. And I think oh, okay. we get some of that that comes up this way. And and literally, I think it's the wildlife that bring it up. Uh, when I get, yeah. and it's true Usually. bluegrass, it's not it's not the POA annual bulbous bluegrass or anything like that. Probably our biggest weed issue here in grass seed production is, is POANA or, or annual POA. Right. Or bluegrass, annual bluegrass, POA we call it. Yep. And uh, previous podcast talking about timid, your weeds in your timothy stuff that kills it kills your regular grass for the most <laughs> yeah. part yeah and then we've been spraying it for a long time or, or still we the, the growers have been spraying it for a long time trying to control it and creating resistance um, resistance and that's same with annual ryegrass you know annual ryegrass by its name is an annual crop yeah but you got to spray out the re-sprout if you want to plant a new crop or a different crop right and it's getting a lot of, there's a lot of resistant annual out there. In fact, my dad's not ready to spray his yard out so we can't get it under control in his yard. Oh, no. Yeah, well, we think it was already there when he moved in. I was going to say about the bluegrass and the timothy, it doesn't produce a lot of volume of hay. <laughs> it, it really turns no. into a problem when you have, uh, we had a particularly good dry land timothy year this year where we were consistently three to four ten to the acre. Uh, and then you get to a field that has a bad infestation of that bluegrass, and it's a ten and a quarter to the acre, and it just kind of breaks your heart to see. What if I would have done a better job managing this? It, it would have made hundreds of dollars an acre difference. <laughs> and it's tough too because bluegrass wants to grow low to the ground and yep. kind of creates a mat. Yep. You know, it's not as bad as bent grass or bent grass is a rhiz- rhizome type grower. Yep. So it grows off its chillers and stuff, so it really it locks in. But bluegrass can. It mimics those tendencies real quick. We have quack grass too, so I know about grasses that grow from rhizomes. I think everybody's got quack grass. <laughs> oh, it is possible to kill it, but it's not easy. No, it's not. I I worked for a vegetable seed company for six years, and we spent you know, we spent eight hours on our hands and knees with with garden shovels digging up those little root balls. Oh my gosh! Out of a out of an onion seed stock field. Oh, that sounds horrible. <laughs> it was. The wrong boss was in charge that day. <laughs> Instead of just trying to spot spray with some, some toxic chemicals, you just blow it up your hand dig it. wasn't my call to make those days. Anyway, back to your press market. The uh, the export market. Kind of funny what I've been noticing now that I've been involved down in the annual ryegrass country more. If the annual ryegrass gets rained on, then all of a sudden perennial ryegrass straw starts to, to be worth money. <laughs> oh, because so there's just such a volume of annual ryegrass that yeah. that they can, and it's early. It comes off in late June, early July, so it's the first to market, and it's got a lot of volume, so they can move it real fast, and real quick. Right. We do tend once in a while get a Fourth of July rain that really, if it, if that annual ryegrass straw gets rained on, it turns yellow. Right. Like, ugly yellow, kind of like wheat straw does. Right. And so they don't. Nobody wants it. Where your tall fescue and your perennial ryegrass straw, if it gets rained on, as long as it's not huge amounts, it doesn't necessarily turn ugly colors right away. Mm-hmm. So you can get away with, with it a little better. The terms that I keep hearing around 
the quality of grass seed straw is words like shiny and bright. Maybe something that <laughs> you might think about, uh, maybe folks that have done oat straw or wheat straw, you might understand the distinction between something that's kind of a clean and a bright and a shiny, right? Yeah, yeah, because like your wheat straw, you know, fresh, nice, fresh, I don't know, like wheat straw has got a real white, color to it, right? Mm -hmm. But the moment wheat straw gets wet, it turns real bright, bright yellow. And right. If you use it as bedding, you'll, you'll realize that. You'll see that. And that's the same. And it's just like this. It changes colors and so the, the customer or end user or wherever they might be in Japan sees a bunch of bright yellow straw. They're like, well, it's already been wet. Right. Right. Like, Is there a bunch of mold in there now? Right. What's, what's wrong with it? Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Those little changes affect a lot of perception and have, have yeah. just those implications that you're talking about. If it isn't, if it doesn't look it's, just right, maybe it got rained on and maybe there's water issues. If, you know, I took a floor, a forage crops class in, in high school, or college, I mean, community college. Yeah. We were still farming and growing, growing a lot of organic pilots at the time. Yeah. And it was always said, grow in your, in my head for years, even as a kid was, if your hay or your silage makes seed and you're late, Right, but you you go to the farm farm store and you go to buy a bale out orchard grass or Timothy, depending on what part of the country you're in. If they can't see a seed head in it, they don't think it's it's any good. Yeah, that's that's something that we run into in the Timothy world. But you don't. They want to see yeah, that big old they, seed head. That's that's no. a critical component. If it doesn't have a seed head, it's not real <laughs> Timothy. Yeah, which. Timothy doesn't have a huge, a high seed value to begin with, you know. Right. And you start throwing mature, mature crops in there. It's like, well, what is it doing you? Yeah. Yeah, it's just like that. It's all about marketing. <laughs> right. Perception. And those little, those little changes that make all the difference in that perception could be the difference between selling your crop and not. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like packaging your bales. Some yes. guys like... Uh, like a hundred pound orchard grass bale. Some people would, uh, would would grab the fifty pound, who knows what kind of grass it is from the local guy down the street next door because it's fifty pounds. Because I'm from the West Coast, I a hundred pound hay bale is not offensive <laughs> to me. I I get the feeling that if you go like east of the Rockies, that perception changes. <laughs> yeah, I have to say that because I, I I get a kick out of out of reading through some of those. From on making uh -huh. about being able to sell hay here and there, and like everybody's market's different. Yep, everybody's needs are different. Yep. I and mean, there's, like I said, I do a lot of custom spreading in Central Oregon, where I do a lot of a lot of hay growing as well. The vast majority of the hay is put up in either in two tie bales that are what what are the sixteen? Yeah, sixteen what by eighteen. Yep. Yeah, and they're forty six inches or forty eight inches long. Yep. So you're you're averaging ninety to hundred pound bales and big old kind of grass for off out there growing. Yep. Or or big bales. I mean, there's some three tie bales there. Most of that is driven getting sold to to an exporter to a press. Yeah, ex yeah, yeah, that three tie California is a little funky in that most everything is a three tie bale. And that's just Yeah, but it's even it's even funkier than what you're doing, right? So you got the big chamber three tie. Correct. Yeah. So they have uh the chambered, what we refer to as chambered. A chambered bale, yeah. It's a smaller dimension where maybe it's only 14 or 15 inches tall and 21 inches or 22 inches wide instead of 23. Yeah, and it basically, it's the bridge that that two-tie retail market and that, uh, that mechanical um, handling press market. Yeah, so the thought, so the thought guys, process, of course, is you want that three tie bale to be twice as long as it is wide. So if you have a 20, yep. 21 inch wide bale, you make your bales 42 inches long. So they stack really nice. And then if it's chambered down to 14 inches, I think if we do the math, there's fewer cubic inches in that chambered three tie bale than there is in that 16 yeah, so by 18 by 46 inch two, two straight. Yeah. So they, they yeah, the average, I think they're right around 100 pounds, 95 to 100 pounds. I think in another podcast, you guys mentioned Arizona bale, you know, 95. Yeah, trying pound, to hit that perfect 95-pound retail bale. Right, and and the difference up here in Central Oregon is they're dealing with two the larger two-time bale, mm -hmm. uh, which 
you can like, you can stack with a Harrow bed or a stack wagon. Or, uh, a stack yeah, cruiser. I call them bail wagon. I call them, I call them bail wagon. Yeah. I, but, I don't uh, even know what to call them anymore. But, you know, they, they can make an ugly looking stack and they look ugly, but yeah. they stack and they squeeze. Yep. You know, you can squeeze, squeeze road, semi load that way. Yep. The, uh, yeah, the three type block stack is an awesome package. I just, I know there's a lot of folks that disagree, but for mechanical handling, that's an awful good way to go. Oh, yeah. And the two tie block stack doesn't like it doesn't stack as consistent. It just doesn't look quite as pretty. It's still good that you can take a squeeze and pick up three ish tons at a time. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we're Washington and Oregon got that. We're legal. We're all legal for super. You can get overweight for a mix stick that way mm-hmm. for 105, you know, 105,000 pounds. And so, yep. In Oregon, we can put a block behind the truck, cab of the truck, the drum of the truck. Yeah. So you can put nine blocks, nine squeeze blocks on a, on a truck. Washington, I think you guys can only do eight, right? We can only do eight. Yep. We can't put the block yeah, on the frame of the truck. Yeah, because that's considered a triple. Yep. Triple setup. And you guys can only do doubles, whereas Oregon can do doubles and triples. Correct. Yeah, nothing like going through the gorge on 84 with a FedEx truck and that back trailer whipping all around. Wiggle waggles. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of guys in Central Oregon that have been going back to, as what they refer to there, as cowboy bale. Your shorter, what, 36-inch bale. Yeah. They say they can, some, some guys can sell them faster, and some guys say they, they don't sell as fast but they sell them consistently the same amount every year because customers know they're there. Right. They're not having to go out and, and advertise the sale of it or, or find a, a larger buyer to buy the hay. Yeah, that's that's entirely possible. I'm I'm of a firm yeah. belief that there is no one right way to market anything but hay in particular. Yeah, I think, honestly, it's just what you're willing to handle, how you're willing to handle it, right? Yeah, those little, little bales with... with so great, I'm sure, especially on our west side of our state, Washington, Oregon. Yep, higher you population a lot of hobby, areas. Hobby, a lot of hobby farmers and a lot of horse people. That the average woman is not that large, not that muscular, lifting ninety five pound or a hundred and what? What are your big bales at? Oh, <laughs> uh, on the alfalfa, it is possible to have a hundred and twenty five pound average. Yeah, I mean, I don't and that was that. Dry, true dry hay. But on the grass side, it's more, and that three tie, it's more around that 100 pound mark. Yeah, well, that's what you want to aim for. <laughs> but yeah. you go to the farm, see the funny part is you go to these farms, go to a lot of the farm stores, even the ones in, in, in hay country, and they'll sell those those two tie bales faster than they'll sell the three tie bales. It weighs a thin amount of weight. Yeah, there's certainly perceptions around uh, just just the physical width of the bale and the number of strings. I could imagine a scenario where you have a, a three tie that weighs less than a two tie, like we talked about with that volume difference, and the two yep. tie is still going to win out in a retail setting. But, you know, we, you know, and that's funny when we talk about the uh, straw market, grass straw market. I remember as a kid, my dad and uncle owned the Freeman 330, three tie Freeman. Yeah. And they would bale all our grass straw with it behind the combine. Pay somebody to stack it and light it on fire. So, burning the grass straw is one way. Uh, it depends on variety of crop that you're growing a little bit, right? Whether you want to burn it or not. Well, back in the day, you know, early '90s, late '80s, there was no straw market. Period. And so you had to get the straw off in order to keep your field healthy. Right. Um, also, also, you used to be able to field burn everything. My understanding, there was some opposition to smoke along the way that kind of put a kibosh on that. Well, there was, you know, there was always, there was, you know, even back then there was a growing concern for environmental impacts of smoke in the air. Right. But what actually set, what actually put an end to it was down just south of Tangent, I believe close to Eugene, around Harrisburg, if anybody's familiar with Lennon Valley, a farmer called the fire department, got the okay, the winds were blowing the right direction, everything was good. Lit his field on fire, and all of a sudden, halfway through burning the field, the wind shifted and blew directly over I five, Interstate five, and caused a major, major wreck. A lot of people died, and that put an end to open. We all refer to it as open field burning. 
Right. Whereas you take your drip torch and you drive around the edge of your field and light it on fire. So the few people up in what we refer to the northern Atlanta Valley, which is basically north of Salem, most of everybody up here outside of the hills country were using field burners, propane burners. So mm-hmm. you take the spray thing, bale straw, burn the straw stack, and then you go through and you flame the field. It's a more managed burning process. They basically lumped all that in because it's, it wasn't crucial to the production of the crop, you know, and so when you would call your local fire department to get the okay to go burn for a you know, two, three hour window, you had to burn. A lot of times, like, well, you're not, I'm not, it's not an essential process, so no burning today, right? Uh, you're basically, you're at the whims of your local fire, mar- fire chief or fire marshal. Sure. They sure, look sure. fairly on your, on, on things and you were usually okay, but if they didn't like it or got a lot of complaints from, from people within the community, then they would basically put a stop to it. So that's so the only field burning of grass that is left in the western Oregon is a fine fetch view in a real specific small area growing area at the foothills of Cascade Mountain. And they have decided that that's a critical element to production. Yeah, I don't know the details on it because it's for, as I said, fine fescue. Yeah. And I never have been involved in growing it, unless I've been involved with it as fertilizing it. Mm-hmm. So I don't, but I do believe that by burning it pr- promotes growth and, and healthy, healthy plant because you get a longer, longer stand out of it and better yield. Not to mention, not to mention burning it helps control weeds and bugs and other, other pests without or as many chemicals. Right, right. Let's talk about some of the fun equipment that you guys have that nobody else, as far as I know, have. <laughs> like, t- tell me about these sprayers and the, the different configurations and the tire sizes and the tire types, because you guys are in a wet, wet place. Yeah, I mean, that's just like we were asking earlier. It's, I run two fertilizer spreaders. They're custom, I say custom built. They're built locally. Mm-hmm. One was built by a full-time grassy farmer out of Corvallis, Oregon. He uh, kind of developed and built his own buggy, I don't know how many years ago. And his brother saw it and he used it a few times, decided he wanted to go in just like it, had him built, so he built one of those, snowballed. What you're calling a buggy here, describe a buggy to me. So what I what we refer to here in Love Valley as our spreader buggy, kind of a generic term for spreaders, but... At generally, they're a three-wheeled machine. Okay. So like your big carrigators that are three-wheeled, right. but about half, maybe even a third the size of those big machines. And again, it's it's the idea that your ground is so wet that even a, a right. big three-wheel carrigator would have troubles. Yeah, that's that's the whole issue. It's, it's uh, I, mean, I started spreading fertilizer on month on technically it's Friday last week, so that would have been February. So February 5th, I started spreading fertilizer for, for the 2021 season. Yeah. You know, and today, we got probably uh, three quarters of an inch of rain today. started raining. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the only reason I'm not spreading fertilizer tomorrow is we're calling for freezing weather. Can't drive on the grass with a stroke. Oh, uh, okay. But, okay. So my buggy, the one, that I, the one that I drive pretty much every day, just a variation of... Of most of the three wheelers, it weighs empty. It weighs eleven thousand three hundred pounds empty, mm-hmm. and it's got three tundra tires. We call them. They're sixty-six inch diameter tires. They're sixty inches wide. Sorry, say that again. They're, the tire itself is sixty-six inches in diameter, you know, around. Yeah, and it's sixty inches wide. That's a wide tire. Uh, and I run generally this time of year anywhere from six pounds to three pounds of air in each one of them. Right. Low, so, but, lots of surface area. That's what you're looking for. Yeah. But um, the ones that are real cool and real fun that I've yet to drive, and I don't know if I ever want to, are referred to as a duck. D U K. Okay. Originally made by originally made by Rears Manufacturing. You know the guys that make snow mowers and sprayers. Okay, and they and they run on inner tubes. They Just do not inner run tubes on actual tires. Inner tubes, that right. special, heavy, thick walled inner tube. Each so they got they're usually these are usually four wheel machines, and each wheel's got two tubes dueled up together. 
Uh huh. Yeah, and those. <laughs> I think the heaviest, or not the heaviest. Most of those weigh around between six and eight thousand pounds. So you're talking less than a twenty five hundred size pickup truck. Yeah. With four, with, with eight inner tubes for tires. Yes, eight inner tubes for tires, and they are literally when they're running those, they're they're driving on water. They're right. Literally, they're some of those <laughs> machines. When they run empty on fertilizer or chemical, they're got a spray system on them. They run the risk of floating. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah. And for people that don't understand, in, in the south, when you refer to the south of Atlanta Valley, it's all south of Albany, or Albany and south of Eugene. Real heavy clay soils that don't, that they're not drained well. It's, oh. it's like, kind of like yours, it locks in. Oh, I can relate to so that. There is no permutation. Yeah, so there's no permutation, really. Yep. Unless somebody spends a lot of money in drainage, and even then, the drainage doesn't necessarily work. Right. Because it'll just it'll just uh, put concrete in around those the drain tile. Yep. When you look up the NRCS soil survey, and it says zero inches per hour infiltration rate. Yeah. I know so, all about that. <laughs> and, and and in Oregon, we get a lot of rain, but it's all from October into May, early part of May. Yep. And so we need to put fertilizer and chemical on. Fertilizer goes on in, in the springtime. Well, we, I refer to it as spring. It's February into April, depending on the type of grass you're throwing. Mm-hmm. But they're spraying all year round. They never stop spraying. You might take a couple of weeks off here and there. They only really ever stop spraying. But you've got to have rakes that can go when it's wet. Yeah, a lot of guys have, a lot of the bigger guys have gotten, you know, new John Deere's and case sprayers or Agco. Mm-hmm. But they're still putting on those 60 inch wide tires on them. Trying to get that same flotation. And, and not, yeah, it would just, you know, and, and not tear your fields up, right? Cause a lot of your turf type tall testings are, can be in the ground for 20, for over 20 years. You know, I've, I put gold bait on fields that are that are over thirty years old and still producing seed. Still producing seed. They're not producing as much as they could have if they were say ten years old, but enough. They're producing enough seed that it doesn't justify tearing them out and replanting it. Wow, I didn't realize. I genuinely didn't realize that seed seed fields stayed in that long. Well, it's just certain types, like your forage type crops that are you know your your grasses that are those uh, bred to have a longevity. You know, these, sure. Like our perennial ryegrass, you're lucky to get a good third year out of it. Uh, well, okay. A lot of guys have gone to the two-year rotation on your perennial ryegrass. Okay. Um, I can't too quite tell you as much about orchard grass. I think it's it's got a longer life. Kind of, you know, you're you're talking 15 years, maybe. I'm thinking, I'm guessing, but I'm not 100 percent sure. All right. It doesn't take a lot of orchard grass to produce seed. <laughs> yeah. I want to say thank you. This has been a great conversation. I think people will get a, a lot of value out of knowing where the majority of the gorge and grass seed in general is grown. <laughs> and I, I think it's always cool to talk about the equipment modifications that you guys have to have to farm in such a wet place and to farm such unique crops. So thank you. Yeah, no, I'm happy to do it.